Welcome to season two of Gray Maybe, a limited series podcast and social experiment based on this season's topic, the body. My name is Jillian Schmitz. I'm a professional dancer, actor, teacher, author, artist, and cat lover. Through my own personal journey of recovery, I've found that things aren't just black or white, or as simple as yes or no. For me, in my recovery, there has been mostly gray area and a lot of maybes. In most of my stories, you can find the gray maybe. I will be sharing my own process through personal stories, interviews, and hopefully stories from listeners in an effort to help lessen the stigma and shame of disordered eating, eating disorders, and body image. If you'd like to share your story of ED recovery on this podcast, anonymous or otherwise, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com. G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. Before we get started, if you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're using to catch future episodes of Gray Maybe. A note before we begin. The topic of disordered eating, eating disorders, body dysmorphia, and other behavior related to the body may not be difficult for me to share anymore, but it wasn't always this way. I recognize and anticipate the possibility of judgment or disbelief about my experiences, ranging from my own family members to strangers, in addition to the potentiality of losing certain opportunities for publicizing my own experiences. My stories and the stories of others on this podcast are told through the lens of our own experience. The revelation of our process is ours to tell. If you disagree with the views or stories on this podcast, know that we are not speaking on anything other than our own experiences and viewpoints. Take what you like and leave the rest. Nothing expressed or mentioned in this podcast is an endorsement or is meant to be taken as suggestion or advice. It is strictly the sharing of our own experiences and recovery. Any feelings this podcast activates in the listener is for the listener to process and recover from. Any criticism you have based on these experiences and choices are yours, and they are not anyone else's burden to carry. Welcome back, everyone. The last episode kicked off the second season of Gray Maybe, where I shared some of the origins of my eating disorder story. In this episode, I continue telling my story and how I found recovery. So get comfortable wherever you are. Here is part two of my eating disorder story. Trigger warning eating disorder, suicide, depression, weight loss and gain, anorexia, abortion, sexual assault. What are you going to have? My mom held the large menu in front of her face while she scanned. My dad quietly drank his coffee, folded the menu back together, and clasped his hands, resting them on top of it. They sat across from me in the booth, interview style. The same booth we always seemed to get sat at, in the diner chain we'd always go to, after they'd pick me up from the airport. Remember when you used to be a waitress here? My mom chirped predictably. My parents loved to reminisce. I carefully picked out something from the menu that I could eat, and announced what it would be, followed by, I'm on a new diet. I continued nonchalantly by putting the menu down and drinking my black coffee. By now, my mom had put down her menu, not because she had decided, but as if what she really wanted to say was, cut the shit. Instead, she gently said, I see. I was going to say, you look thin, observing pause, maybe too thin. Her brow furrowed in a way that always did when she was irritated or worried. I wondered how she could tell. As I was wearing baggy clothing, and although she'd hugged me hello, I didn't think I had lost that much weight. Although her confirmation energized me and egged me on, I felt high on what I saw as the ultimate compliment. My parents were used to all of my diets and food requirements by now. They accepted it easily and with support, probably because of how I explained it to them, much like my mentors had explained it to me. The only problem was that it had long ago slipped past eating like an athlete, and now into a full-blown obsession. This was the second time in my adult life I would be so thin my mother commented on it, not in the way some parents do where culturally they show love through feeding to excess, but in a way that made me have to deliver some kind of alibi, some kind of damage control. It was time for the familiar speech, 
the lip service I'd become so comfortable reciting. I explained I was eating really well and really busy and active. I brushed it off like it was no big deal. It seemed to work. Nonetheless, it was what they wanted to hear. The truth was, once I crawled out of a depressive episode and stepped back into my life, that well of darkness was still churning inside of me. I felt like I needed to be punished, and if I couldn't control my life and what happened to me or how I felt, I would control what I would eat. This felt so familiar, it felt normal. My body I still saw as an endless ruin that needed fixing. When I wasn't dieting or restricting, I was constantly thinking about what I would eat, if I would gain weight, how dissatisfied with my body I already was, and what I'd already eaten that day, and the day before that, and the day before that. There would be periods of indulgences, followed by regret and restriction. The gym was a punishment camp, a place to visit when I needed to lose weight or counteract something horrible I'd eaten, a place to do my time. The more information I would gain on the topics of food, the more I would funnel it into my most current diet. It didn't have to be double-blind. It didn't have to be science at all. Anything I saw, I morphed to fit my narrative. I had read somewhere that plastic containers can contribute to cancer. And even though at the time I smoked cigarettes regularly, I stopped eating things that came in plastic or eating out of plastic. I read something about meat is bad for you and takes three to five days to fully digest. True or not, it didn't matter to me. I went vegetarian for over a year. I had learned about raw diets being the newest trend in health, so I followed one strictly and basically shit liquid for six months. I was under the impression that organic produce was more nutritious than non-organic produce, so if I couldn't get organic, I assumed it would be best for me not to eat at all. In my head, it was better to not eat than to eat something quote-unquote toxic. Towards the end of my disease, almost everything was toxic. I never allowed myself to eat what I classified as junk food or candy. One day I was in a tornado of a sugar craving, and instead of eating the chocolate I so desperately wanted, I went to Target, bought, and ate an entire roll of chocolate-flavored calcium chews in my car, one after the other until the roll was gone. I didn't look like I had an eating disorder. I was far from stereotypically anorexic. I didn't push my food around on the plate or hide it. In fact, I was often so starving, I woofed food down in such a fast and insatiable way, I often gave myself stomach aches. I didn't lose my period from not eating or weight loss. I didn't start growing a layer of hair all over my body I'd seen on some people with diagnosed anorexia. I hadn't even lost probably what would be classified as medically a significant amount of body weight, but I was always starving. This was the second time in my life I was weighing in or around 100 pounds at 5'5 five, five and a half, and to my disease, it felt great. Let me specify. I felt like I looked great or close to great. I was almost back to what I had weighed after my second year on apprenticeship in the summer of 2002, when I was 20 years old. I had graduated my program, ready to conquer the dance world. I was the best dancer I'd ever been and the thinnest I'd ever imagined I could be. I was weighing a little over 100 pounds. My five, five and a half frame was starting to look skeletal. I loved it. I felt accomplished. I felt empowered. And I was finally starting to look like the waif models of the 90s I'd spent so much time obsessing over. People around me weren't as complimentary. Are you eating? Or as my friend Eric said, you look like you're sick. Not everyone was concerned. Many people complimented me, told me I was almost there that I'd never looked better, that I was snatched or at my fighting weight. I don't remember what I actually responded with, but I know I took it all as the most cherished compliments. The real answer was no, I wasn't eating, not entirely because I didn't want to. I literally didn't have time to. The schedule I was keeping towards the very end of my apprenticeship, leading up to my final showcase, did not allow time for proper eating breaks or digestion. I drank orange juice and took bites of food when I could. At night, I would eat a big meal of whatever I wanted, the reward for my all-day hard work and starvation. After my apprenticeship was over and the show and schedule ended, I wasn't able to sustain the accidental anorexia. I was disappointed in my body's inability to stay at such an unrealistic prototype. I gained back the appropriate weight, and although, looking back, I looked phenomenal and still very, very thin, I felt overweight. I loathed my curves. Everything I ate was a lengthy mental conversation and a silent debate. 
Every day I had to figure out how I would be active enough to lose the weight or maintain the frail physique I desired. Now, sitting in front of my parents at the diner, I was back to being snatched, and my fighting weight. I was back to buying the smallest sizes, sometimes even in the children's section, and relishing in the righteousness of it all. I enjoyed how everything I tried on fit and looked good on me. I didn't have the breakdowns in the dressing room, because if the jeans fit my thighs, they never fit my waist, and if they fit my waist, they never fit my thighs. I didn't have to pinch parts of the fabric that gapped when everything else was too tight, and pull the parts that were too tight to see if over time it would stretch. At this body size, things just fit. But it didn't matter that I was thin, and by most accounts, perhaps even too thin. It wasn't enough. It wasn't the first time, nor was it enough this time. I was determined to get down to 100 pounds. The depression this time wasn't like when I was 13. I had made it past the suicidal part of this episode, which followed my first abortion, three very difficult relationships, and one questionable sexual assault. This depression had transformed into being almost unconscious. Most of the time, I didn't even really recognize it, because it seemed so constant and I was functioning. My conscious mind didn't seem disturbed or disabled. Almost as if the volume knob of the depression had turned down low. I could still hear it, and it was still playing all the time, but just at a low hum in the background. For me, when I was single, it was easy to hide. There's no automatic person to hold me accountable for my behavior or actions. When I was in my apartment alone, I didn't have to prove I was eating. I didn't have meals with anyone, so most of the time I just didn't. I could drink as much as I wanted, and no one was there to see it. To outsiders, I never looked better. Professionally, things were picking up. I was busy, and jobs were coming in one after the other with regularity. I was active in the dance community and regularly was hanging out with friends. Internally, I was a mess, dysfunctional. When I was home alone, I would drink to excess in the solitude of my apartment, at all hours into the night obsessing over what had happened with the past relationships and disappointments. The hurts I had, I would loop on repeat with the same songs that spoke to my sadness, and I'd scour the internet and social media's early days. I was restricting my diet to around 800 calories a day. At first, it wasn't something I thought about. Then, when I added it up, that became a magic number, and it became an obsession a restraint I could successfully live within. It made me feel strong, and when I'd curl up to sleep at night, I loved the way my ribs stuck out and I could feel the bones against my thighs. I couldn't see outside of my mind enough to think I had a problem. Having an eating disorder wasn't what I thought it would be like. It wasn't cut and dry. They say that eating disorders live in the mind, not the body. My sickness was definitely infecting my mind most. There were a lot of traits I held previous to the noticeable weight loss, one of which was not being able to admit the first time I'd lost so much weight was an actual eating disorder. I didn't meet the criteria of what I thought that was, but it's called a disorder because it's just that, a dis-order, a dis-ease. My body dysmorphia may have started with my displeasure with what I wanted my body to be, starting around the age of 13, but it kept only growing occupying more and more space in my mind, encompassing every outfit choice, every food option, and every mirror or reflective surface that I could glance at. I still don't know if that first big weight loss was indeed my insane schedule, or if I just blamed it on that as an excuse to not eat, or if it started out that way and grew to become something else. That's how fucked up my brain is about it. I really don't know the truth, just like I really don't know what I actually look like. There is how I want to look, how I think I look, and how I really do look, and I might not actually ever know the reality. Regardless of how I got there, the results spoke for themselves, and by then I was a runaway train, or like addicts call it, chasing the dragon. I kept thinking just five more pounds, but it was never going to be enough. I was still eating, technically, and I wanted to eat, so I told myself I wasn't anorexic although I verbally abused myself for not having the willpower of a criteria-qualifying anorexic. I wasn't in a hospital, so I thought I could still stand to lose quite a bit more of weight before it would become a real issue. I kept finding reasons for why I didn't qualify. I was not sick. I did not have an eating disorder. In 2017, I had a debilitating knee injury. I refused to accept it and even waited weeks before getting an official diagnosis and MRI. 
I kept dancing, even though there was something very wrong with my knee. Even after the diagnosis and recommended surgery, I refused and kept dancing. I stubbornly and insanely thought I could somehow heal myself, make myself strong enough, and also quietly and shamefully wondered if the care or lack of care I'd shown my body over all of these years had led me to this moment. I vowed to change. I was going to healthy eat my knee back to health. I was going to eat three meals a day and no longer rob my muscles of energy in my attempt to burn fat on an empty stomach. Except I couldn't do it. At all. I could not do it. And then I gave myself a secondary injury on a job and barely could walk out of the venue by myself. I pretended I could, though, and smiled through the agonizing pain. After the gig, I couldn't walk for two weeks. I celebrated my 35th birthday bedridden and caved. I didn't have any other options. I pleaded with a god I didn't believe in, and I made a deal. I give up. I will get the surgery. God make me walk again so I can finish my last few jobs over the next few months so I can financially support myself after I have the surgery. Days later, God made good on the promise to walk, and I made good on the promise to have the surgery. The injury, my attempting to eat more regularly, and all of the emotional turmoil of the situation sent my weight skyrocketing. The morning of my surgery, I weighed in at 140 pounds. I felt defeated, and like my body was betraying me. The recovery was supposed to be six months of no dancing. I started physical therapy right away and yoga at eight weeks. I tried to eat sensibly, but I wasn't overly concerned about my weight or body throughout the recovery. I returned to work five and a half months after my surgery with my doctor's blessing. It was a job I could control what I did and what I wore. I wanted to be back so badly, I wanted to be fixed. I was far from being back to the dancer I was, and far from being back to who I thought I was. After that job, I took a few gigs I knew I could safely do. And soon, I was back to a full schedule again. Everyone kept saying, you're back. And I was. But I didn't feel back. I felt so different. Everything about me felt different. I definitely wasn't back to the dancer I was. But besides that, I didn't feel even remotely like the person I was. I felt like I was trying to claim a life that was no longer mine. The next thing that happened, I can only explain as slipping into a racquetball game between depression and anxiety. I went back to the habits that had always helped me through the familiar discomfort, controlling my eating under the guise of health and drinking. I was hell-bent on losing weight as healthily as I could. Pre-surgery, my weight had been at its highest in my life. I had comfortably dropped the excess weight I'd put on pre-surgery when I was laid up and had returned to a common holding pattern weight of around 127 to 130 pounds. In my mind, I needed to drop weight, but more than weight, I needed to change, but something different than not what I was. I needed to feel some control. One night, standing with peers at a gig while they were smoking their cigarettes on our break, one of my friends took a drag, and with a sly smile and fresh kick of sweet nicotine, she cooed. You look amazing. What are you doing? Starving, I thought. That's what I was doing. Denying, restricting, controlling my food. Without pause, I said, oh, you know, just eating clean. I dropped my eyes, and I lied like I had so many other times in my life when I dropped weight and people complimented me. The only difference was this time I felt guilt for it. I knew what I was doing. One evening, I was discussing eating plans with my partner, which always started out with me asking questions and expressing the desire for some kind of diet that would net me some kind of results which mimicked starvation, to which he would predictably try and educate me on how the body actually worked, and then with me arguing with him. One of us has actual credits in nutrition and health, and one of us doesn't, and I'll give you a hint. It's not me. When out of frustration with me, he finally said, you can't do that type of a diet. It isn't for you because you have an eating disorder. I heard him but I kept arguing my now moot point. I'd never had someone tell me that I had an eating disorder. I never thought I qualified. A few days later, I called my health insurance and set up an appointment to see a psychologist specific to eating disorders. My knee surgery kicked off, no pun, a series of recoveries. I had quit smoking before my knee surgery and had started to experiment with sobriety. 
I started going to Al-Anon meetings to heal my interpersonal relationships and my control issues and started seeing formal help for my eating disorder, disordered eating, and body dysmorphia and control issues. I started going to OA Overeaters Anonymous meetings where I found a lot of people who were just like me and a lot of people who were just like me in different ways. I kept going to therapy and kept going to 12-step meetings. I published two adult recovery coloring books and I slowly started to be honest and unashamed about my history with my disordered eating. In the early days of my recovery, I remember my eating disorder and me felt like it was us against the world. My disorder was so enmeshed with myself, it felt like part of my personality. My eating disorder voice in my head sounded just like my real voice. It felt like it was me. Changing felt like losing my best and most helpful friend. Those early steps towards health felt like I was thrown into a boxing ring, and because I couldn't separate myself from my disorder, it felt like it was us, my eating disorder and I, against recovery. I still remember feeling like a win for recovery felt like a loss for me. I was getting pummeled every day in the recovery ring, doing things that were actually good for me but felt bad. There were so many times my eating disorder was able to twist my mind up. For instance, previous to recovery, one day driving, I was mentally planning a strict diet under the guise of improving my physique. And I was plotting what I would eat, how pure and clean it would be, and how little of it I would allow myself no matter how much of it I wanted. I knew my partner would be out of town, so I'd be able to do it without distraction or question. I was perturbed I would only be able to hide it for a few days, when a voice in my head that sounded just like my own voice said, get rid of him. A partner of over a decade at the time, whom I was content with, my disease had said to terminate it all so that I could be alone in my dysfunction, all so that it could continue to live. This is what I was up against, but I stayed the course. I slowly found my way. I stopped starving myself to fit a body that wasn't truly mine and no longer served me. I ferociously fought to love myself at any cost. I'm still working on that. I defended myself, advocated for myself, invested in myself, stood up for myself, created boundaries to protect myself. I kept showing up and I kept sharing. I listened to my pounding heart and let my tears rip. I acknowledged every pit in my stomach. I spoke through tears and sometimes yelled while my voice shook. I claimed my peace and my peace. I stopped seeing one therapist and found another. I kept going to meetings. I listened to books that resonated. I read books that fellows and my therapist recommended. I had no choice but to be present. I took deep breaths and listened when people talked. I loved people I didn't know. I loved even harder the people I did know. I started telling them I loved them. Turns out it's a lot easier to love others when you love yourself. I allowed myself to fully be taken over by the present and remove myself from situations that didn't fit anymore. I still ricocheted between depression and anxiety, but I told people about it. I exposed my truth over and over again. I started serving me. I lost my filter and in the process went too far sometimes. I brought it back center and aimed for balance. I paused sometimes and acted on impulse often. I stopped seeing everything as either or. I challenged myself to not categorize everything as black or white. In recovery, I found my gray and I found my maybe. I want to stress how much I neglected getting help because I didn't think I qualified. I remained sick simply because I didn't think I was sick enough. I've linked some of the most common disorders in the show notes, including anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, and orthorexia. Because I'm most related to anorexia, but felt the least qualifying for it, I want to share an excerpt from the Cleveland Clinic, also linked in the show notes. You cannot tell if a person has anorexia just by their appearance because anorexia also involves mental and behavioral components, not just physical. A person does not need to be underweight to have anorexia. Larger-bodied individuals can also have anorexia. However, they may be less likely to be diagnosed 
due to cultural stigma against fat and obesity. In addition, someone can be underweight without having anorexia. Remember, anorexia also includes psychological and behavioral components as well as physical. There are several emotional, behavioral, and physical signs and symptoms of anorexia. If you or someone you know experiences the signs and symptoms of anorexia below, it's important to seek help. Emotional and mental signs of anorexia include having an intense fear of gaining weight, being unable to realistically assess your body weight and shape, having a distorted self-image, having an obsessive interest in food, calories, and dieting, feeling overweight or fat even if you're underweight, fear of certain foods or food groups, being very self-critical, denying the seriousness of your low body weight and or food restriction, feeling a strong desire to be in control, feeling irritable and or depressed, experiencing thoughts of self-harm or suicide. Behavioral signs of anorexia include changes in eating habits or routines, such as eating foods in certain order or rearranging foods on a plate, a sudden change in dietary preferences, such as eliminating certain food types or food groups, making frequent comments about feeling fat or overweight despite weight loss, purging through intentional vomiting and or misusing laxatives or diuretics, going to the bathroom after each eating, using diet pills or appetite suppressants, compulsive and excessive exercising or extreme physical training, continuing to diet even when your weight is low for your sex height and stature, making meals for others but not yourself, wearing loose clothing and or wearing layers to hide weight loss and stay warm, withdrawing from friends and social events. Physical signs and symptoms of anorexia. The most well-known physical sign of anorexia is low body weight for a person's height, sex, and stature. However, it's important to remember that someone can have anorexia without being underweight. In addition to weight-related signs of anorexia, there are also physical symptoms that are actually side effects of starvation and malnutrition. Physical signs of anorexia include significant weight loss over several weeks or months, not maintaining an appropriate body weight based on your height, age, sex, stature, and physical health, unexplained change in growth curve or body mass index BMI in children and still growing adolescents, physical symptoms of anorexia that are side effects of starvation and malnutrition include dizziness and or fainting, feeling tired, slow heartbeat or irregular heartbeat, low blood pressure, poor concentration and focus, feeling cold all the time, absent period or irregular menstrual periods, shortness of breath, bloating and or abdominal pain, muscle weakness and loss of muscle mass, dry skin, brittle nails and or thinning hair, poor wound healing and frequent illness, bluish or purple coloring of the hands and feet. What causes anorexia? Anorexia and all eating disorders are complex conditions. For this reason, the exact cause of anorexia is unknown, but research suggests that a combination of certain genetic factors, psychological traits, and environmental factors, especially sociocultural factors, might be responsible. Factors that may be involved in developing anorexia include genetics. Research suggests that approximately 50 to 80 percent of the risk of developing an eating disorder is genetic. People with first-degree relatives, siblings, or parents with an eating disorder are 10 times more likely to develop an eating disorder, which suggests a genetic link. Changes in brain chemistry may also play a role, particularly changes to the brain reward system, and neurotransmitters, such as serotonin and dopamine, which can affect appetite, mood, and impulse control. Trauma. Many experts believe that eating disorders, including anorexia, are caused by people attempting to cope with overwhelming feelings and painful emotions by controlling food. Physical abuse or sexual abuse, for example, can contribute to some people developing an eating disorder. Environment and culture. Cultures that idealize a particular body type, usually thin bodies, can place unnecessary pressure on people to achieve unrealistic body standards. Popular culture and images in media and advertising often link thinness to popularity, success, beauty, and happiness. This may contribute to someone developing anorexia. Peer pressure. Particularly for children and adolescents, peer pressure can be a very powerful force. Experiencing teasing, bullying, or ridiculing because of appearance or weight can contribute to the development of anorexia. Emotional health. Perfectionism, impulsive behavior, and difficult relationships can all play a role in lowering a person's self-esteem and perceived self-worth. This can make them vulnerable to developing anorexia. It's important to note that there's no single path to an eating disorder or anorexia. 
for many people, irregular eating behaviors, also called disordered eating, represent an inappropriate coping strategy that becomes permanent over time. This pathway to disordered eating is true for some, but not all, who develop anorexia. Again, all of that was directly from the Cleveland Clinic linked in the show notes. If you're listening to this episode and you're realizing that you are more like me than not, welcome, and I hope this helps you take a step in the direction of recovery if you haven't already. You're not alone. Just a reminder, for anyone who needs to hear it, you don't need to wait until you're sick enough to get help. In fact, you don't have to be sick at all, just a desire to feel a little better. If you're listening right now and you're struggling with an eating disorder, disordered eating, or other behaviors, welcome. Know that whatever you're feeling, there are those among us that have probably felt it too, and you're not alone. If you're listening because you have someone you love in your life that is suffering or is in recovery for an eating disorder, welcome. You are also not alone. Even having an eating disorder myself, I have not reacted the best I could to others who were struggling before my own recovery. I've linked in the show notes a link for the do's and don'ts of how to deal with someone suffering. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you were able to find something relatable in today's episode. As I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, this is also a social experiment to see if in telling my story, I can embolden listeners to share their stories. If you'd like me to read your recovery story on this topic, anonymous or otherwise, on the podcast, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com, G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. Thank you to everyone who helped make this Gray Maybe podcast happen. Producer and editor, Roderick Barge. Cover photo by Jose Perez. Music, licensed by Pixabay. Special counsel, Jada Ellingham and Roderick Barge. Special shout out to supporter, Patty Olgan. If you'd like to support this podcast, please rate, share, comment, and subscribe. Until next time, bye for now.